thanks for joining us today. All right, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Lord, you're the reason we're here. You deserve all the glory. We love you, Lord. Jesus, we give you all the glory. Sing, let praise be a weapon. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. Let's praise Him this morning, yeah. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift Him high with all creation cry.
for his faithfulness in your own life. Oh, Jesus, I thank you. You've never left my side. No matter my circumstance, I choose to look to you. Let's sing this together. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. And I'm safe with Are we hoping that today? Rain.
Hey, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, hey, good to have you here with us. And uh, you know, every time, uh, every, every week during this moment, we take a pause to kind of remind ourselves what we're doing here. Um, so we, we take time to sing songs and worship together. But really, this is such a powerful thing that we have the privilege of doing here this morning because we are a group of people who are, you know, I know we have people joining online and here in the room. We're a group of people who believe that we were created some, for something bigger than just ourselves, right? We are joining together to center ourselves as a community around the fact that we belong to Jesus, that our lives are created to worship him, created to give him glory. And, and so as we sing this next song, here's what I want us to do is just let's take a moment and just take a breath and slow down. Maybe close your eyes wherever you're at. Just take a deep breath in for a moment and remember that this is what we were created to do. So we can get so strung up in everything else that's going on and, and, and the ups and downs of life that we forget that God has our back, right? And that when we trust in him and we depend on him and when we say, Jesus, you are the center, we recenter ourselves on who we were made to be. And so that's what this next song that we're gonna sing is, is it's saying, God, you deserve everything. Everything is for you. Our whole lives are centered around you. And so as we get ready to sing this, let's just kind of focus in on that together. Lord, we center ourselves on who you are. You are the rock. You are our foundation. We know we were created to worship you, to praise you. And so now we gather together to do that. We worship you, Lord. Sing, I lift my voice. I lift my voice to sing of your goodness. I lift my voice to sing of your love. I lift my voice to sing hallelujah. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. Every breath we breathe, you are worthy of. I lift my voice to sing of your goodness. I lift my voice to sing of your love. I lift my voice to sing hallelujah. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. That's the truth. That's the center right there. Let's sing together now. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. So we give you the highest praise. Jesus, our Savior, your word.
I know you'll return. You will reign in glory forever. You will reign in glory forever. Expressing yourself to Jesus, I choose to live for you. Oh, every breath is for you. My life is surrendered to you. Oh, it's all for you.
and I Every breath Every moment I'm away Lord have your way in me yeah, Have your way in me We're going to do part three of the Greater Than series today that we started a couple weeks ago. This is a combo life group study, potentially, if you're studying that in your life groups, uh, that stuff by Francis Chan, and then the weekend messages are sort of a tied to each other that way. And last weekend, we had at the Hampton campus, Ron Johnson, who's like a spiritual dad in my life on Father's Day, he was the speaker. And a couple things I'll just point out from that particular visit from him. First, he said at the, the beginning of the service, he said, I have 17 grandkids. Do you remember? Remember that? And I was like, I have a new goal. I'm going to beat, beat Ron Johnson. I mean, that's an awesome thing. That's a lot of grandkids, but what a, what a great family he has. And then secondly, we were having dinner and he said, Hey, we just bought a new house down in Orlando. Let me just show you a picture of what was in our backyard. He pulled out his phone and he went to the picture and it was a black bear walking across his backyard in Orlando, Florida. First, I said, I didn't know that Florida had bear. I thought they were too, too hot down there. But he said, no, it's pretty normal for bear to kind of roam around. And I said, well, we have deer, but not, not bear that I know of. And so that made me curious. And I remember reading something. There's a website called WikiHow, and it tells you how to do stuff. And so there were nine steps on how to deal with an unexpected bear encounter. So let me give you a couple of these so you're prepared. You ready? First, identify the type of bear you have just seen. How many of you think you could do that? No, me neither. Okay, then assess the bear's mood and behavior. <laughs> okay. Number three, deal calmly with the situation. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm capable of that. Number four, know when to play dead. Actually, I guess there's some bear that you're supposed to play dead with and others not. That would be an important thing to know. Um, number five, exploit the bear's weaknesses. Okay. How many of you are really helped right now? Okay. Me neither. I would die. I know that. There's no way I would survive that. But probably all of us know somebody in our life who's a, you know, forest ranger or they're good at hunting or whatever, and they would be the perfect person, right, to handle a moment with the bear in the woods. How many of you know somebody like that in your life? Anybody? Okay, by the way, here's another strategy. This is what Pastor Greg, our pa pastor from the Butler campus said. He said, if someone else is with you, here's the other strategy. You just got to run faster than them. And if you're, if you're not faster than them, just kick their legs out from underneath them and then run away. I'm not sure how Christian that is, but that's another piece of advice we'll just put into the mix of that. All right, okay, so now what I will say to you is when you are in a moment of panic, steps and processes aren't very helpful. Even if you could memorize the nine steps, if you happen to encounter a bear, you would be struggling with just the steps of what to do in the midst of that. And that is kind of comparable to a lot of things in life, isn't it? Because a lot of times we hear steps and processes for how to deal with trauma in life. And then when trauma arrives, right? When you get the diagnosis from the doctor you weren't expecting, when you find out you're in an unexpected divorce, when you've been betrayed by somebody in your life, when you lost the job you never thought you would lose, when you're grieving the loss of someone in your in your family and you never thought that they would die at this stage like you you think oh, these things happen at that moment there is so much emotion there is so much pain there is so much grief that a nine-step process is not all that helpful now it might be wise and, and maybe they're the right steps but a process is just not enough. And if you're like me, I have lived through some stuff in my life and here's what I know problems in life don't stand in line. They don't arrive one at a time and you're like, okay, I can deal with you. And then when you're done, I'll deal with the next thing. They come in stacks, don't they? And so often I find myself as a pastor sitting across from somebody who has scheduled an appointment with me to say, I need to talk to you about what's going on in my life. And when they start to unfold the complicated, tangled web of challenges they're going through, there is a go-to piece of advice that I provide that I want to talk about this morning. Okay, there's something that in those moments that I have learned is a pathway forward when you're in a situation uh, that is turbulent and traumatic. Okay, and, and here is the piece of advice that we're going to camp on and walk through today. And that's this. Everyone needs a network of support around their life. 
Everyone needs a network of support. So a lot of times people are staring across from me and they're like, pastor, tell me what to do. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you because that is really complicated or that is really difficult. There's no, not a simple answer for that. So I, I can be a part of the process for you. I can be your pastor. I can pray for you. I can listen to you. I can encourage you. But for what you're going through, you need a web of people around you. You need a lot of resources around you. So let's talk about a strategy for how to build a network of support around your life that's gonna be a support system to see you through things. I'll just say this. What you need in a crisis is not a process, although process probably will be involved. What you need is the right people. It's not the right process you need. It's actually the right people that you need around your life. And you'll notice the second part of the sentence here, everyone needs a network of support around their life, but I cannot wait for a crisis to build it. Because let's say maybe you're not in a crisis moment right now. Well, if you live long enough, you will encounter them. They're just part of the journey, right? And, and if, you, if you hit something traumatic in your life and you don't have a network of support around you, you can build it there, but it's much more difficult to build it in the air, so to speak, right? You're trying to fly the plane and build the network at the same time. If, if you already got it built, if you've already got it built, it's much easier to just lean into that in those moments when you're struggling through some things. Now, we're going to, to see this principle at work in the life of Simon Peter in a New Testament book called the book of Acts. Now, Simon Peter is one of Jesus' disciples. We typically know the stories of Simon Peter from the moments in the gospels, the stories or histories of the life of Jesus. And, and yet Simon Peter is also very much featured in the early church era after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension into heaven where the church is born. And he's one of the key leaders there. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 12 together. And here's what it tells us was happening in his his life or at that time. It says it was about that time, verse 1, Acts chapter 12, that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. So the church is this early radical raw movement that's going on and now is becoming a threat to some of the local leaders in that region. And so Herod, intending to persecute the, those who are followers of Christ, had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Okay, who's James? Jesus had his 12 disciples, Simon Peter's one of them. Jesus has like a top three that he, he spent more time with. And they were Simon, Peter, James, and John. James and John are brothers. They are called in the scripture, the sons of thunder. And so one of the top three disciples, James, is, is martyred for his faith in Christ. And actually, I've been to the place where that happened. It's right along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's in a city called Caesarea Philippi. He was actually killed by the sword, um, in an amphitheater, the amphitheater still stands today. And so they led him out onto the stage in front of a whole crowd of people and they asked him to deny Christ and he would not. And so they cut his head off as a part of the entertainment for the day. And he was there martyred for his faith. So after this happens, it sends shockwaves into the church world. And it says in verse three, when he saw that this met with approval amongst the religious Jews in the region, he proceeded then to seize Peter also. And this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. So let's paint the picture now for Simon Peter. The festival of unleavened bread is, the, is another way of saying the Passover season, which happens to be the exact time of year that Jesus was crucified. And so if you know the story about Simon Peter and Jesus, he was the one who, when Jesus was on trial, was in the garden and he's warming himself by the fire and they ask him, are you one of his followers? And he denies Jesus three times. He denies that he knows him and then the rooster crows out. Okay, and so then Jesus is taken away and he's crucified on the cross. And so Simon Peter lived that era at that same time of year. Do you know, sometimes seasons change and you can go out and just smell the change in the weather. And like fall for me, I, I just start to go, and I think, oh no, I have to go back to school. Oh, no, I really don't. But I remember those years, right? Or I think football season, come on, right? Sometimes smells and sounds remind you of things. So can you see him now? He's been arrested and thrown in prison at the same time of year that he watched Jesus crucified on the cross. This had to be quite an emotional moment for him. And he's watched what's happened to James now. And it says, after arresting him, he, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. 
Okay, let me, just, let me just have a little pastoral moment. If in our country it ever hits the point where Christians are persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ, I want to be the kind of pastor and spiritual leader that is so dangerously preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that they have to guard me with 16 soldiers. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that, right? Okay, come on. Can you see this, Peter? Guarded by four squads of Roman centurions. There were Roman gladiators or whatever they were, right? And so here he is in prison. And now now he's on trial and they're waiting to bring him out at Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. Now notice this, but the church, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Okay, here's the first part of the network of support. Now you expect for me to say this, but let me just say it directly. And that is, I need a healthy church family. I need to belong someplace to a healthy church family because belonging to a church, I have a group of people that has my back. Do you know what I love about Allison Park Church at all of our locations? Just about every weekend, we pause at the end of the worship set and we say, we as a whole service here are gonna pray for one person in need and we're gonna focus our faith together. Maybe they're online, maybe they're in the room, but we're gonna agree together in faith because we're all about the one. We care about that one person who's hurting, who's alone, who's forgotten, who's struggling, who's suffering, and we want to focus our attention and our faith. I love that about Allison Park Church. I think this is part of what we're supposed to be doing as a church family, to reach out to that one person in need and to be a part of having their back. So Simon Peter's in prison and the whole church is praying for him. This is a good thing. Now, let me describe in the last couple of years, I believe that there is, okay, there are world events that are happening that are just very complicated. According to the New Testament worldview, we believe that there are forces at work beyond what we can see in the natural. The Bible talks about spiritual forces in high places, which are trying to wreak havoc on our world and destroy our life. And I actually think there are two primary attacks that we're seeing going against the church in general. I'm just not talking about Alice Park Church. I'm talking about the church overall, okay? The first one, and you will, you will instantly, as soon as I say this word, be in agreement, I'm sure. The first is this, division. So one of the things that's entered the church overall is a division over a host of things. And what did Jesus teach? A house divided itself against itself cannot stand. So if you want to defeat someone or something, get the team fighting against one another and you'll have an advantage. Okay, so this is starting, you know, people arguing about everything, resentful, hateful, you know, whatever. It's just going on. And unfortunately, it isn't just the world that's affected by this. It's, it's, it's happening within the church world too. Uh, that is not my topic for today, but I could keep on preaching on that for a few minutes if, if I wanted to. Okay, here, here is the second tool that the enemy is using against us as people of faith. It is not just division, it's isolation. So we all had to lock away. We all were sort of distanced. We all went online. We all are working remote. We're all, all you know, and now all of a sudden we're two years in And here's what happens. A person that becomes isolated and is suffering in silence or struggling with something in silence becomes far more vulnerable to increasing problems with mental health, spiritual health, and so many other things in their life. And so we're dealing with an epidemic of isolation and the fallout of that in people's lives. And, you know, you know, the principle, so we compare this, you know, Jesus talks about how he's the great shepherd and we're like sheep, shepherd and sheep, try, the, the shepherd tries to keep the flock together because if one wanders off, he, be, he or she becomes vulnerable to a predator. And so the sh- shepherd has two tools. One is a shepherd's staff, which has a kind of a crook on the end of it that he takes and he yanks those sheep back into the fold. And then the second is a rod, rod and staff. You know, Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod is used like a boomerang. When he sees a predator coming, he whips that boomerang or that, that rod at the predator to try to protect the sheep. Well, so part of what has to happen for us to be healthy is for us to be in community where you're known and you're seen and you're, you're contributing and people are aware of what's happening for you. And, and there's a place where there is some place to process what's going on in your life. And this is part of what we all need in the world is we need a healthy church family. And in order for this stronghold to be broken, we've got to decide to break out of the hiddenness and to step into community and connectedness. 
And so the very first thing, yeah, okay, give it up for that. I agree as well. Let it be Lord, right? So I need a healthy church family. That's the first thing that we see in the story with Simon Peter. Let's read on now. Okay, it's, it then tells us, so Peter was kept in prison and the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around your waist and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison and he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought it was just sort of a dream or a vision. It was so hard to believe. They passed through the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And can you see it? It opened up, you know, you know right in front of them. They went through and as they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Okay, let me give you an unexpected second part of the network of support around your life. And that is this, I need the activity of the hosts of heaven in my life. You know, some of the things we, we, we talk about, I just mentioned this earlier, Ephesians chapter six says, we don't battle against flesh and blood. Our real problem is not with people. It's with the spiritual forces of darkness that are using things in this world, people and other things to try to bring destruction upon us. And New Testament talks about the fact that there are demonic forces. Okay, I'm not going to dive into that deeply, but there are times when probably you feel like I'm under attack here. Something is going on beyond just what I can see. Okay, we often focus on the negative side, the demon part of, of that particular story, that idea of, of forces in the heavenly realms. But there is another side to this, and that, that there are angels of heaven, not visible to us, but that are active on our behalf. You know, when I started my year reading the Bible, I read through the one-year Bible every year, and we start in the book of Matthew, and Matthew talks about the story of Joseph and how he was trying to raise Jesus now as his you know, son, and, 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 and it talks about five times in Joseph's life because of the turbulence around him where angels intervened in the early stages. And I started to see that, and I was like, you know, I probably don't give enough credit to the fact that God is working on my behalf in unseen ways through the angelic host of heaven. And, and so every time I'm reading this year through the Bible, I'm going to underline the things that deal with this because you see it a lot. And here we have Simon Peter walking out of the prison because God sent an angel to have his back. Now, I, I don't know where you are in your journey of faith, but let me just say the Bible talks about angels being assigned to us. You know, Psalm 91 says he has given his Angels command concerning you to guard you in all your ways. May they lift you up in their hands, lest you strike your foot against the stone. I pray that for my family all the time. God, send your angels to protect them. Drive away every force of darkness and send the angels of heaven. Can I just say to you, you are not alone. Not only do you belong to the family of God, if you have given your life to Christ, you have angels in heaven assigned to you to work on your behalf. And actually the scripture says, let me give you another verse here. Daniel chapter nine describes a moment in another hero of faith. And Daniel is describing this. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen earlier in the vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me, as soon as you began to pray, a word went out from heaven, and I have come to tell you, you're highly esteemed. Your prayers not just activate heaven's answers, answers to prayer that we ask for, but they activate the angels of heaven on your behalf. I don't know about you, but I kind of like that idea. That part of what is supporting me through this trauma or trial is that God is mobilizing the angels of heaven to support my journey so that I can see the will of God accomplished in my life. Okay, let's keep on reading now. Uh, back to Acts 12, verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When, he had, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary. Okay, now... This gives us a little information here. The mother of John, also called Mark. So this guy, John Mark, is actually the writer of the second of the histories of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is that Mark here. It's his mama's house named Mary. 
And he goes to this house where many people had gathered and were praying for Peter. Now, I'm going to foreshadow what point three is here as we're journeying through the story in in Acts Acts chapter 12. But the second thing that happened, or the third thing that that is a part of the the network of support for, for Peter was he had a small group that was willing to stay up all night and pray for him. And I want to ask you as we're in this journey, if you were going through it, would you have a room of people somewhere that would stay up all night to pray for you and care for you and support you? Not, not your natural family for a moment. Just think beyond natural family. Do you have a room somewhere that you know so well that you are in, in doing life with to such a degree that they would be there to stay up all night for you? And you're, and you're like, yeah, um, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know where you are in that, but let me just describe Simon Peter's group. So he goes to Mary's house, John Mark's mama, and they have this group of people and he knocks on the door at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. Now, let me just set this up. They're praying all night in faith for Simon Peter to be rescued from prison. And, and so they're agreeing together, God, you know, send your angels to protect him, set him free, Lord, have favor somehow. And she recognized Peter's voice, this servant girl, Rhoda. So she was overjoyed, but so excited, she left him outside. And she ran back without opening the door and she exclaimed to the group, the small group gathered, Peter is at the door. And they told her, these great men and women of faith, you are out of your mind, they say to this girl. But when she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. Let me just pause for a moment and say, your group doesn't have to be perfect. They don't have to have all the faith in the world. They don't have to always get it right. But you need a room somewhere of imperfect people who are praying for you. But Peter kept on knocking. Can you imagine? This story would be really different if they never opened the door and they got rearrested. I mean, how would we read that in the scripture? Like they didn't, they, you know, so eventually he's knocking, knocking, knocking. When they opened the door, they saw him and they were astonished. And Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Okay, so here's the, that third point. I need a small group of people built on mutual commitment. Meaning that if you have this room that you have been investing in and and you've been investing in their crises and they've been investing in yours um, and you know each other based on that, when the moments arise and stuff happens, you have something strong that is gonna be that network of support for your life. Remember I said, it's not the steps or the processes where you're a crisis that matter the most, although they're important to take the right ones. It's the right people. I was just talking with my cousin. She lives up in Erie. Her and her husband have just gone through several health difficulties. He just had a a surgery he went through. And when I saw her, you know, I got the report. You know, how are you doing? And she told me some of the details medically, that what they were going through in the recovery time and all. And then she said, with tears in her eyes, oh, but our small group at our church has been so wonderful for us. She said, if I, if I wasn't already a part of this church, I would join this church it's just because of the way that they have cared for us. Oh my goodness, it's been so amazing. And I thought, that is the story that we want everyone to be able to tell. That they have some group of people that they're friends with, that they do life with. Yeah, okay, so you study the material that we put out and stuff like that, but it's really about those relationships, a serve team, a support group, a a life group of some kind. Now, let me just say, finding the right small group in a church is a little bit like dating. If you've tried this before, you know, sometimes you get in one and you're like, eh, this didn't really feel like it was supposed to feel. I'm not sure I belong here. How many weeks in this series still I have to end this relationship, right? And, and it feels a little bit like that. And so, and so you go to one, and eh, it's not a good first date. And you go to another, not a good first date. And you start to think, well, maybe small groups are not for me until you find the one. And when you find the right one, you're like, oh, how could I do life without this? This is amazing. And here's the deal. A lot of people in their spiritual journey have a few bad first dates and they give up on the concept and they start doing church in rows, sitting to a sermon, listening to a sermon, I should say, rather than in community because it's people are okay. It's imperfect and it's a journey and it's work and it, it takes time till it gels. And when it gels, wow it becomes an amazing thing. Now, the stronghold of isolation doesn't get broken unless we intentionally start to build this. 
Let me give you the final point, and, and that's this. In the story, it then ends by saying, uh, Peter, in this small group meeting, says, tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, verse 17, and so then he left for another place. Okay, some of you said, I thought James was martyred. What's complicated in sometimes Bible history is there's a lot of Jameses and there's a lot of Johns. And so James, the disciple of Jesus, was described at the beginning of the chapter. He died in martyrdom. But this James is actually the half-brother of Jesus. Now, you, you actually, one of, the, one of the greatest proofs that Jesus rose from the dead is that he convinced his own brother. Like his own brother becomes a proponent of the resurrection. And his half-brother becomes the leader, the lead pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And Simon Peter says, tell the lead pastor... Tell the pastor here that, uh, that I'm out and, and communicate this to the staff, right? So here's the first, fourth point. If you're going through a trauma and you need the right people around your life, you need mentors and leaders who have a skill set of some type that can help you through it. You might need a counselor. You might need a doctor. You might need a lawyer. You probably need a pastor. You need somebody somewhere that's going to contribute to the knowledge base and the support base of what you're going through to help you process the things so that you can get yourself well and right and moving forward. And it is, listen, up to you when you're in a crisis moment to build your network. No one can do that for you. No one can say, here's your healthy church. Here's your pastoral leader. Here's your small group. Here's the person. You, you can get advice for it. But if you don't build that around your life, it, you will just go through it, unfortunately, more alone than you need to be. And if you have it built in a healthy season, then it's there for you whenever stuff starts to go sideways. Now, let me talk about how we break the stronghold of isolation, okay? Let me just summarize. And, and I know maybe you've prayed prayers like this. I haven't. I'm going to just sort of tell a story about my own personal journey. When I was younger, uh, especially when I was in college and I was away from home, sometimes I'd be in a church, visiting a church, and uh, going through a, a hard time and needing ministry, needing someone to pray for me, someone to talk to. And so sometimes at the end of the service, the pastor would close and he'd be like, okay, we're going to have a little time of prayer. And if you want to stick around, the worship team will be playing. You can, you can come to the front or kneel at your seat or whatever you want to do. And so sometimes I would come forward and I would, I would go to what we call the altar and I would kneel down in that moment. And I would pray a prayer like this. Maybe you've prayed a prayer like this before. God, if you really love me, if you really care about me, send somebody right now to me to just put their hand on my back and pray over me. And about half the time, I would pray that prayer. Someone would come over and either God would prompt them or it was a coincidence or whatever, just a caring person. And they would put their hand on me. And sometimes they didn't. And I was left mystified. You know, God, maybe you don't care about me. Okay, let me just tell you a couple things. As, as vulnerable and natural as that kind of a prayer is, it is both not helpful and not biblical. Why? Because you don't need someone to show up with their hand on your back to know that God loves you. <laughs> Let me just say, if you want to know God loves you, you look at the cross of Jesus Christ. He hung on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He died for you. He went into the tomb for you. He rose from the grave for you. If you want to know, God, do you love me? Look at Jesus. He is the symbol of the love of God in your life. And he's promised it to you. He said, I'm never going to leave you and I'm never going to forsake you. So yes, in our growing up years, there are times when we say, God, please give me a sign. You know, if you really love me, make it snow. I know it's July. But you know what I'm saying? Like, come on, you know, at times, some point we got to mature past that and we've got to say, I will settle this. My feet are planted on the foundation of the choice-based love of God for my life. Yeah. Okay. A second reason why it's unbiblical is this. Do you know that James chapter five says, if there's anyone who's sick, if you find yourself emotionally sick, physically sick, mentally unwell, and you're struggling, here's what it says. They should call the elders of the church and say, pray for me. And the prayer of faith will make the sick person well. See, the first step of faith, if you want to see a breakthrough in your life, is for you to raise your hand and say, over here, I need help. Do you know, in any one of those churches that I was at, kneeling down saying, God, if, I, if you love me, send someone to me. If I had stood up and turned around and say, over here, <laughs> I am a college student and I'm out, uh, away from home. I need to talk to somebody. There would have been 30 people in the room who would have ran to my side and said, absolutely, what can we do for you? 
You know, a lot of times we are wanting God to give a word to someone to come over and break that isolation. It is my responsibility and your responsibility to initiate the cry for help. And boy, there's so many people who are suffering through this isolation period that we're going through in our world. And let me just say to you, if you are going through that right now, you are not alone, but that aloneness you feel won't lift off your life until you say, over here. Would you pray for me? Would you talk to me? Would you help me? Look, we are here as a church family because we want to help build that network around your life. But you have to start the journey because, you know, we are all responsible for getting the right people around us so that we can move through the difficult times in life and then enjoy the wonderful times in life and then be available to each other for one another's challenges. So help us, Lord, we pray. Can you just turn your face toward heaven? Let's pray today. God, we, we, we just pray that you would deliver us from the, the fallout of the last couple of years. Lord, we don't wanna be divided. We don't wanna be isolated. We want to be a part of answering the call and the challenge of our era. And, and for those who feel all alone today, I pray that you would bring us together, bring us through. Lord, may there be many great conversations that happen out of these weekends that you would bring us into a place of health again in the name of Jesus. We pray that in his name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand up together? We're going to sing and worship in just a moment. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there were some other things going on in our country that were happening, the shootings in Buffalo and Texas and other stuff. And uh, we did something on a weekend that was so good. It was at the end of the service, we said, rather than just ending the service, we're going to take a few minutes right now and pray for our country. And many people reflected back to say, that was really good. We need to do that more often because, you know, this, this is... Um, a chance for us to have a mini prayer meeting as a congregation. And when else can we all be together to do this? And we're already in the room for weekend service. So why don't we just, for five, six minutes, we're just going to stick around if you want to do that and pray, okay? So we're going to get ready to pray. The worship team is going to lead us, and then I'll come back and give us some instruction. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me Lord, I give you my heart I give you my soul I live I want to take about 30 seconds and just sort of pastor this moment, if you'll give me opportunity. I'm going to say a couple things, and I'll just ask everybody not to react, um, because I want to just lead us into something, all right? So obviously this week was very eventful with what the Supreme Court decided with Roe versus Wade. And as we are all reacting to that as a country, I want to remind you of something I said a few weeks ago. I did a little video before we had a prayer over this very same issue. And I said, Allison Park Church and its values are two things. Number one, we're 100% pro-woman. And number two, we're 100% pro-life. And, and, okay, so listen, the culture does not want us to be both. The culture wants us to pick. And we won't, we're not gonna pick. We're gonna pray for both of these things because we believe this is the balanced focus of followers of Jesus Christ, okay? So we're going to now step into the gap. I know, I know the world's trying to pull us apart, but we're going to agree together and we're going to say, God, would you do something in this situation? So would you just turn your face toward heaven right now and let's pray. Father, we thank you that when you created us all, you created us uniquely, distinctly. As we talked a few weeks ago, when the sperm and the egg meet, there is instantly an explosion of 215 million gigabytes of DNA information put onto each one of us. You are a creator of life. You value life. 
We are thankful that our Supreme Court expressed a value for life this week, but we know, God, that our culture is still very divided over this. And so we pray now that there would be an awakening, God, an awakening of value that everybody we lock eyes with, we would see this is someone God loves. This is someone Jesus died for. God, that you would you would elevate this, that there would be a sense of value on children, on, on people that are different from us, on, on, the, on the elderly, on those in the womb. Lord, we pray that you would raise up an awakening of value on people that we could see through your eyes, God. And we pray that a spiritual awakening would come to the United States. I know it seems so unlikely right now, but God, would you move upon us in that way? We pray in the name of Jesus together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now we're going to pray for women. I'm going to have Pastor Debbie Lynch come out. She's going to pray for this. We're going to pray for women in the house here today and everybody across this area. So Debbie, lead us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. We come before you, God, and we are so grateful that you are a God of love. You're a God of hope. You're a merciful God. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that we don't walk alone. That Father God, there may be women in this house right now that have walked that journey. That Father, maybe you're facing that decision. And Father God, we just pray that we would be a family around them, that we would give them, Father God, your mercy, their grace, your hope, your peace. Father God, we thank you, Jesus, that all across this nation, there are women that love you, that need you, that, that need to feel your grace and your mercy today. So we ask God that you would pour it out, pour it out across this nation, pour across this, the people in our community, in our church here, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are that God of hope and peace and comfort. And God, we pray for our ministry called the Embrace Grace. We know, Father God, that that is a ministry that needs your workers. They need your love. They need your mercy. We pray, God, that you'll give them divine appointments, that girls would come and they would know that they are embraced by your grace and by our grace. So, Father God, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us. Give us eyes to see. Give us a heart of love. And, Father God, we come against guilt we come against shame, that people that may have walked through this, and we ask you, Father God, that they would sense your presence in a powerful way today. So Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace. Amen. Amen. Let's just take a moment, let's sing through this again and just sing it as a decision of surrender. Go ahead, Sarah, lead us. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. All right, one more thing we're going to pray for. You know, I'm really thankful that a couple of years ago we started the Treasured Kids Ministry and we now have, I think it is 11 families that have stepped up to foster and adopt children. And we believe there's gonna be many more to come. It's awesome, yeah. You know, there are 1,800 kids in foster care in Allegheny County alone, 400,000 across the, the nation. And, and so we're gonna pray for those kids. And because there could be an increase now of a number of people in foster care, can we just pray over them right now? So Jesus, we ask for the kids in our own house, the church that are now being brought into these families, we pray you'd surround these families, equip them, strengthen them, bless these young people as they find a safe haven, a place of love and grace and belonging. We pray God that out of this moment, there would be a revival in our nation so that the churches around the country would step up to be the solution for the 400,000. Father, let there be a move of adoption. Let there be a move, God, 
We're, we're now, we are not just known as people who stand up for what is right, but we, we are people who are known for those who open up their lives and say, we'll, we'll bring in a kid. We'll, we'll, we'll sacrifice. We'll invest. God, we pray that the church would be known for that, that we'd be known as a place of love, a place of compassion, a place of adoption. Lord, that it would even be so strong, such a solution brought to the country. God, that people who are away from you would turn to you just because they see the display of that love and grace. And Lord, we pray right here in Allegheny County, we ask, Lord, that you would make us and other churches in our region part of the answer, we pray. Lord, we, we, we value life everywhere. We want to stand for that today. And we thank you, God, for the privilege of praying. And we pray in Jesus' name together. And everybody said amen. 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 Awesome. Okay. Thanks for staying and praying. When you feel to go, God bless. Have a great day. The band's going to play as you're on your way out today. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the last minute. Three things that we want you to know. The first is what an incredible message. Ooh. And man, that is so good to find a network that you can rely on because everyone goes through seasons of struggle. So I think the best way that we can uh, maybe move on that now is if you're not part of a life group, I challenge you this week, find a life group. You can go on the website, on the app. They are listed there. You can sign up for one there as well. Our team is ready to help you find that. And life groups are life-changing, for real. Uh, I've been a part of one and it has been so healthy for me to have that network. Uh, so when I struggle or when I know other people that are struggling, we can pull them into that group. And man, it is just so, so good. 100%. And there is a life group for everybody. Yeah. You know, we have a ton of different life groups for different demographics. So. I would encourage you, like Sean was saying, go to the website today. Don't wait another second because yeah. it's so important. And hey, I just want to say, if you made the decision today to follow Jesus with your life for the first time, I just want to say I'm so excited for you. Uh, yeah. We just want to celebrate you. So if you wouldn't mind uh, texting 2022 decision, that's all one word, 2022 decision to 97,000 or even just letting us know in the chat on whatever platform you're watching on. Again, we'd love to celebrate you and also really help you in this, you know, first step of your journey. So we got yeah. some resources for you as well as uh, connecting you with the pastor. So again, we're so pumped if that is you. Yeah, and we want to say Alza Park Church, thank you for your generosity. If it's your first time joining us, please feel no pressure with this moment. But if you would like to give, you can go on the app, on our website, you can text any dollar amount to 84321. Your giving is making a real impact in things like Embrace Grace or Treasured Kids. What we just prayed about would not be possible without your continued giving and generosity. So we want to say again, thank you so much for who you are, for how you're giving. And man, we had a great weekend. We hope you did as well. We love you guys and we'll see you next week. Bye.